The soldiers, sailors, and airmen come home in 1945. They've earned their rest from Bougainville to Berlin, Rabaul to Rome, Tarawa to Tokyo. They've fought the best that Hitler, Mussolini, and Tojo could throw at them, and they've won. The price of victory is high in dead, wounded, and lives forever shattered. Americans are eager to put the war behind them. The atomic bomb is an American monopoly, and some think war is now a relic of the past. The new United Nations promises the errors of the League of Nations in the 1920s and 1930s will not be repeated. The world seems on the verge of a blissful new era of peace and cooperation. Rapidly, far too imprudently, we draw down all our military forces to minuscule levels. Technology has changed as well. The increasingly familiar whistle of the jet airplane is replacing the clatter of piston engines and whirling propellers. A piloted airplane has just flown faster than sound. Swept wings for high-speed flight are replacing the straight wings dating from the Wright brothers. Jet-powered international air commerce promises to dominate global transportation. But soon there is growing tension. A vast Soviet espionage network is active in the United States. The Soviets are taking up permanent residence in Europe as well. An iron curtain, Winston Churchill says, has descended from the Baltic to the Adriatic. In 1948, the Soviets make their move, cutting off Berlin by imposing a crippling blockade on all surface transport. The solution? the United States Air Force. Recognizing the decisive importance of air power, Congress has created the Air Force in 1947 as a separate and independent military service. Berlin is its first challenge. In the skies over Germany, the men and women of the new service prove that they are equal to the task. A year later, thanks to airlift, Berlin is still free and dictator Joseph Stalin's plans have been thwarted. The West is awake to the threat of Soviet communism, a 40-year struggle that fittingly will end in Berlin in 1989. Asia is another story. In 1949, communist forces sweep to power in China and the Soviets detonate their own A-bomb. The next year, a triumvirate of communist dictators, the Soviet Union's Stalin, China's Mao Zedong, and North Korea's Kim Il-sung, embark on an even more ambitious conquest, the invasion and subjugation of South Korea. Korea, a name unfamiliar to most Americans, a beautiful but troubled land recovering from years of brutal Japanese occupation. A proud country divided by the 38th parallel, the North locked in an increasingly repressive communist dictatorship, and the South enjoying the first flourish of democracy. Now, for the determined and striving people of free Korea, that war turns very hot, very fast. Feeling threatened by the rapidly advancing UN forces, Communist China enters the war in November with hundreds of thousands of troops. June 25, 1950. Massive Soviet and Chinese-trained Communist forces sweep southward. Covered by snarling yak fighters and Sturmovik attack bombers, racing tank columns and infantry, overrun much smaller and less well-armed and equipped South Korean and American defenders. Seoul is quickly overrun. Not for the first time, America is plunged into war. Despite the odds, Koreans and Americans fight back with grim determination. Bolstered by a Soviet boycott of the Security Council, the United Nations quickly votes to go to the assistance of South Korea. But with the enemy advancing so rapidly, what can be done? The armed invasion of the Republic of Korea continues. The answer is air power. The United States Air Force, ably assisted by its joint and coalition partners, take the North Korean forces under fire. F-80 jet fighters sweep the skies of Yaks and Sturmovics. In July 
still fire to dope for it, over. And then attack communist ground forces. Mustangs strafe advancing columns and deployed enemy forces. B-26s bomb roads and railroads. And massive B-29s return to war, blasting strategic targets, bridges and troops. Transports bring in vitally needed supplies and personnel. Days turn into weeks, but thanks to air power, South Korea hangs on. Valiant South Korean and American ground forces make their stand, digging in along the Naktung River. Communist troops massing for attack are mercilessly bombed and strafed by United Nations aircraft. Assailed from the air, denied the ability to use its own air force, the enemy advance is halted before the Korean town of Busan. Lieutenant General Walton Walker, commander of the U.S. 8th Army, credits the hall to air attack, noting that without air power, we would not have been able to stay in Korea. With their supply lines overextended and under constant attack, the communists are vulnerable. In a masterful counterstroke, the legendary Douglas MacArthur launches a devastatingly affected invasion at Incheon. Shattered North Korean forces retreat rapidly. Covered by constant and responsive air power, UN forces fight to the Yalu River. American Marines enjoy a cold Thanksgiving with turkey and all the trimmings supplied by the U.S. Air Force. Like their older brothers who fought in Europe in 1944, they hope to be home by Christmas. But such is not to be. Feeling threatened by the rapidly advancing U.N. forces, Communist China enters the war in November with hundreds of thousands of troops. Cut off and isolated, advanced elements of the UN forces are plunged into desperate battle saved by joint service air power. Spotter planes guide deadly fighter bombers protecting the flanks of the retreating columns while transports remove wounded and deliver supplies. In the east, the Marines begin a harrowing retreat from the chosen reservoirs covered magnificently by Marine and Navy air power. Air Force airlifters drop bridge sections to enable the retreating Marine column to cross a gorge whose bridge has been blown by enemy forces. Thanks to air support and air supply, the Marine column withdraws in good order with its equipment and vehicles and evacuates successfully to fight again. As UN forces retreat southwards past Seoul for the second time, air power continues to hammer advancing Chinese communist and North Korean forces. But a new danger has emerged. The Soviet MiG-15, a speedy swept-wing jet fighter which clearly outclasses every Allied fighter in Korea. Though UN pilots are more than a match for their adversaries, 
many of whom are Soviet fighter pilots sent by Stalin, the MiG threatens to seize air superiority. Fortunately, the Air Force has an answer, the elegant North American F-86 Sabre. These revolutionary fighters are quickly sent to Korea, entering combat in mid-December 1950. As curvaceous and deadly as their namesake, the Sabres, flown by highly skilled and supremely aggressive pilots, quickly dominate the MiGs. By war's end, they will have shot down an average of eight MiGs for every Sabre lost. The combination of Sabres shooting down MiGs and B-29s bombing North Korean airfields prevents the Communists from using their own air power against UN ground forces. One captured report states, if we had had strong air support, we could have driven the enemy into the sea. So the enemy advance is reversed in early 1951. Once again, UN forces reach the 38th parallel and the front stabilizes along a rough southwest-northeast line as the communists ask for armistice talks. The talks begin and Lieutenant General Nam Il, the senior enemy delegate, states to his UN counterparts, without support of your aerial bombing alone, your ground forces would have been unable to hold their present positions. Air power has saved Korea for the second time. UN Commander General Matthew Ridgway said bluntly, not only did air power save us from disaster, but without it, the mission of the United Nations forces could not have been accomplished. Until the conclusion of the armistice in July 1953, the men and women of the Far East Air Forces and Bomber Command, the regulars, the reservists, and the guardsmen who comprised America's total force carry the war to the enemy every day and every night. Bombers pound strategic targets and airfields, roads and rail lines. Transports haul vitally needed supplies and personnel. Helicopter and seaplane crews undertake heroic rescues. Fighter bombers strike deep into North Korea and furnish close air support at the fighting front. Reconnaissance pilots and crews fly alone and unafraid deep into communist territory. And overall, the Sabres continue to hold the MiGs at bay, a blessed cover of air domination ensuring the success of joint and coalition forces. Thanks to flexible, responsive, and devastating air power, South Korea was preserved as a free nation. UN Commander General Matthew Ridgway said bluntly, not only did air power save us from disaster, but without it, the mission of the United Nations forces could not have been accomplished. So it is fitting we honor the airmen who fought in Korea. They flew over 720,000 sorties, dropped over 418,000 tons of bombs, and fired nearly 370,000 rockets and 167 million rounds of machine gun ammunition. They destroyed 75% of the tanks, 81% of the trucks, and 72% of the artillery that the communists lost. Fully 47% of the enemy troops killed in Korea fell before air attack. But freedom is never free. 
and the price of their success was 1,841 dead, wounded, and missing, and 1,466 aircraft lost. Hundreds more languished in prison camps, where many died from malnutrition and from the appalling brutality of their captors. Fifty years have passed since Sabres took off from Kimpo and other fields, trading sooty smoke as they climbed out over Korea's blue-gray mountains for the cold fastness of MiG alley combat. Korea retaught the vital importance of air dominance and encouraged development of some of the core capabilities of today's global air force, air refueling, rapid mobility and reach, precision attack. Stealth bombers, space-based sensors, supersonic fighters, global transports, UAVs, to name just a few, may not seem related to what happened over the Yalu a half century ago, but they represent the logical outgrowth of progressive aerospace power since that time. Air dominance has always proven the single most critical factor for the success of America's joint force team. And it is that enduring lesson we must hold most closely to today. Thanks to it, we can exploit America's new way of war, using the power and shock of air attack to halt and control opponents at a distance, minimizing the risks and danger of the close fight. We did it in the breakout across France in 1944, Korea in 1950, Vietnam in 1972, Iraq in 1991, Bosnia in 1995, and Kosovo in 1999. It's why we are developing the F-22 Raptor America's vital edge for the joint force wars of the 21st century. For those of Korea and all our wars, we salute you, we honor you, we treasure you, and we pledge to always remember and cherish you. You are a lasting and enduring inspiration to us, the men and women who choose today to wear Air Force Blue in freedom's cause. You've bequeathed to us a golden legacy of courage and accomplishment. That legacy fuels our own fierce determination today to furnish America with a rapid and responsive global vigilance, reach, and power required by the uncertain world and the multitudinous threats of the 21st century.